Kelly. Uh -huh. Hi, everybody, uh, both people online right now and those who will watch it later. Uh, I will start off by saying thank you to all of you who are you are part of the course as well as those who are listening to it. Because I understand that by listening to this talk and reading my work, you're actually committing some of your time and giving up time that you could have spent on other things. Uh, and that is actually an honor and I respect that. And I want you to know that I appreciate it. So uh, today's session it coincides with uh, the publication of the third part of my essay, uh, The Unmaking of Paradise, uh, uh, Literacy as Trojan Horse. And so I'm actually going to stake this point as, as a way to both talk about the article, the reason I wrote the article, as well as connect it to the issues of fake news and the kind of things that we are talking about in our class at the moment. Uh, so. Now, let me tell you a bit more about why I started doing this work. Um, I've actually published a, a, about it as well in We Mountains. Actually, my very first article in the We Mountains is called uh, From Ramsey Center to Subaltern Linguistics, A Call for Action. Now, uh, what was Ramsey Center and why is it that it triggered uh, such a response in, in, in how I saw what was going on? So essentially what I saw with the Ramsey Center was uh, an attempt by an ultra right wing, a liberal neoconservative uh, party and group of influencers, which include uh, people like our ex prime ministers, uh, like John Howard and others, uh, who were part of this group. And their goal essentially was to establish a, a center, a Ramsey Center of studies, uh, of study of Western civilization. Now, notice this Ramsey Center was a center that was being established to further the goals of Western civilization. And that's the point where I sort of took pause and I said, wait a second, aren't we already a center for Western civilization? Isn't the whole University of Sydney already a center for Western civilization? And then I started realizing that when they say that they want a center for Western civilization, what they're really saying is they want to stop the kind of work that we do, where we, we look at the, uh, the people and the communities and work with the communities in order to enable them and support them. And what I saw through the Ramsey Center uh, saga uh, at the University of Sydney, but they were never able to form it, but they were able to uh, set one up at the University of Wollongong, which is a smaller university and was not able to resist it the same way as the University of Sydney did. Now, this whole situation set up, showed me very clearly that what was going on is there is a desire to actually take academia even further into discrediting non-Western theories, non-Western conceptualizations of the world, non-Western ways of thinking. And it was at that point that I realized that I need to start maybe theorizing about linguistics and language, not from my training, which is in English, uh, but through my mother tongue, which is Boli, uh, which is uh, which in, 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 you know, people call it Hindi, Urdu, whatever names they give it, but essentially what it is is Bodhi. Now, it's extremely important that we understand why I use the word Bodhi. And to do that, I'm going to actually take us into this article. Uh, by the way, the artwork for this uh, essay, all three parts, uh, which I will talk about as well, uh, were done by my daughter. So this is the artwork for part three, which is uh, an image, image of a world that we might inhibit once uh, we have been able to shake off the chains of colonization that bind us. So of course, this is not the world that we live in today, but this is definitely a world that we can move into. So the world we live in today, I will change this screen so that you can see where we are at the moment. Uh, and then from there on, I will move to the other part of the talk. So here it is. Uh, this is where we are. You can see this is not very nice. Um, Okay, going on to share the screen. Okay, so now you can see my screen, right? So this is part three of the essay, uh, which just came out uh, yesterday. And I want to specifically focus right here. And I know this is something that I've talked about before. Uh, we have discussed it before, but I'm gonna come back to this because this is extremely relevant and important in how we see and do our work. Now, before I go into and talk about these, the, the, the five sensory systems and what they mean uh, and how we use them in both understanding the situations around us, uh, analyzing uh, material, uh, but also at the same time uh, in, in trying to think of how we proceed and in terms of our own educational uh, work and how we uh, 
sort of train our students up to uh, do work that can be beneficial for our communities. So uh, the first thing we need to sort of separate out is, is actually not just the senses, but why the senses? Now, the five senses that we see here are essentially the ways that we connect with the material world outside us, right? So if you want to do anything in the material world, if you want to walk from one place to another, if you want to pick up a book, if I want to pick up this mug and have a, have a sip, then all of this means that I need to be using my multiple sensory systems, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, all of it right, to be able to navigate my way. So for example, if, you know, if there was something really disgusting and smelly around here, then the way I would approach my getting the mug would be different because I would be, I will shift my behavior based on my, what my sensory inputs are telling me. So then when, when we look at these sensory inputs, each of these sensory systems is independent of each other. And that is extremely important for us to realize. They are not necessarily dependent on each other. And that each sensory system makes meaning for us, not just a component of it. Now, to understand that, think of it this way. Imagine that, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure where you are, but imagine that you're sitting somewhere and you, your eyes closed, somewhere there's traffic going by, right? Can you identify the different kind of vehicles that are passing by? Can you tell the difference between a motorcycle and a car and a truck? Can you tell the difference between what's going very fast and what's going very slow? Can you tell the difference between what's coming towards you and what's moving away from you? Now, if your eyes are closed and you're, you, you can still perceive all of these things, then it means that your perception and your understanding of what's happening outside is totally dependent on your sound. So imagine if, if when people don't have sight, for example, people are blind can exist pretty normally because they can use sound to replace a lot of things that sight do, right? And similarly, people who cannot speak can use sight and therefore use sign language to replace what sound cannot do, what, sound, what, what they can't do with sound, right? So these sensory systems are totally independent of each other. It's not like if somebody cannot see, they will also not be able to hear. We know that it's, they're two different things. Now, that is the primary thing that we need to focus on because it tells us that in language, the primary thing that is language is the oral language, that is boli. Anything that is written is not boli. It's a visual representation of boli, right? It's the visual system. It's using sight. It's no longer using the sound. Now, as soon as you move out of sound and you start focusing on sight, so when you look at sight in terms of carrying meanings that we have in language or boli, then there are multiple ways in which we can represent our meanings of boli through the visual system. Now, you can, there are two major ways of doing it. One, you, your, your, your visual system, that is your writing system, is dependent or tied to the sound system, which is essentially most of us here use languages that do this, right? So the uh, phonetic alphabets or any alphabet that is phonetic based or syllabic based essentially means that we are representing sounds uh, in our visual system and using the sound based symbols to create relationships with the, with the, with, with sight, sound, sorry, yeah, said sound, right? And as opposed to systems where you can actually create representations, visual representations that are independent of the, the sound. So for example, Chinese by and large is independent. So people, if whether, regardless of whether they speak Japanese or Mandarin or Cantonese, they can all communicate through the same writing system, right? So the oral language doesn't bind them. And that's a strength. That's a huge strength that the rest of us don't have because it means that people can interact with each other even if they don't have a shared boli, right? And notice that is a very interesting way of differentiating and looking at language. So boli or language is essentially just oral, when you add the writing system, it's an add-on. Now, notice again that the definitions of these terms in different languages are different. So in, in my boli, boli is always oral, right? It's always oral. Writing systems didn't exist for us for a very, very long time. So there, were, there are no texts in, in Urdu or Hindi, which, is, which predate about 200 years, right? If that, not even that much. Right? Why is it that we didn't have these texts? If people spoke Urdu and Hindi, which they did, even though they did not call it Urdu and Hindi, those names were given by the British, 
to divide the people, the people had the same language, Boli. And that Boli, but that Boli was not necessarily put down on paper. Now, that's a very important understanding that Boli was essentially an oral language. Uh, I'm sorry, but somebody's mic seems to be turned on. Can you please turn it off? Okay. All right. So uh, when we see uh, how what essentially the British did was gave us this, just gave us this category of language. Notice language is a category. It's not something that it's not an X language, right? It's a category, just like religion. Religion is a category. It's not a particular set of beliefs or practices. It's a category. And both of these categories come to us through English. These are not categories that we even have a name for in Boli, right? So that we, that's why we borrow these terms. Or we mistranslate them into concepts that appear to be similar in Boli but are not. And those mistranslations are extremely costly for, for the communities because it can disharmonize the way that the communities operated through their own social semiotic systems. So essentially, in a sense, what I'm, I'm sort of suggesting is that part of the colonization process was a, uh, was a process of social semiotic violence through which they altered the way that we used language, the way that we created our categories. So for example, in Boli, we, did not, we don't necessarily have to pluralize it. A boli can be a, a, a collective noun, right? So as a collective noun, uh, we, it means that we don't separate out necessarily all the different boli because it's just boli, right? So that the way that one group speaks or the other group speaks doesn't really matter because it's still just the boli, right? And the writing system didn't exist as in that sense. So therefore, there was no linking of, of the boli to a particular visual system which tied the, the, the visual system to the oral, oral system. And notice this is one of the worst possible ways in which you can create a writing system. You know, especially if a phonetically based writing system is, I would argue, the worst writing system because as soon as you've got phonetic, phonological variations across a community, you're not you know, able, uh, no longer able to, to maintain all of those uh, variations within the script or the writing system. And therefore, a certain set so a certain uh, way of writing, a certain way of spelling will have to become uh, as le sort of legitimized or, or sort of codified as the standard and everybody will have to m match up to that. And that creates, you know, essentially hierarchies. And we know as teachers in the classroom that these hierarchies of how people have differential access to language uh, impact their performance and uh, engagement with education and, and life, uh, right? So it, it, we know these things are really important. So sight and sound has to be, has to be separated. Now, one, why, why can I start separating these things? One of the reasons why we can separate them, sorry, I just have to check if there's a message uh, in the uh, YouTube. Um, uh, it is working. Can somebody please uh, go onto the group and just tell them how to log on so that I can continue talking? Okay, so I, actually, let me take a pause here. Uh, are there any questions that you would like me to answer at this point? All right, so why did I come into this realization of, of, of the importance of the sensory systems? It's, it's partly because I've ex been extremely interested in the notion of time. What does time mean? Uh, and this has started back a couple of years ago when I was invited uh, by the University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver uh, for one of their TESOL symposiums where I was asked to talk about the notion of space and time in relation to TESOL. And, and so it, that sort of started by journey and interest into looking at how do we see time and what is time in, in relationship to a human human uh, beings' existence, uh, their social semiotic senses, and their material world. And, and through that, and through this other work on sensory systems, I've started realizing that essentially what you have is, is our two worlds. There is a material world and there is a non-material world. Now, uh, people might think it's simplistic, but actually, it's, it's, yes, it is simplistic. And that's, I guess, in a sense, it's the beauty of it. It's, it's once you get the understanding, the basic understanding of it, it's pretty simple. It's actually, you will realize how far reaching the effects of it are. Uh, Yes, that is correct. Lynn just said that uh, uh, oral language unfolds in time because it is, in, in a sense, it is here and now. Of course, it can also be recorded 
and when it is recorded it sort of changes and especially if you already know the oral text and you're going to listen to it again which is something you often do with writing so the, the, there are of course uh, interesting things that we we will can of course consider and I, I i would love to talk about these things because they fascinate me uh but let's um, keep my i'm going to keep my focus today on the material and the non-material a bit uh so imagine this our existence at any moment in time is at the juncture of the material and the non-material. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. What I mean by this is you guys, wherever you might be, that is where you are present at the moment and there are things happening around you. And as you're seeing things happen, as you're listening to things happen, you're interpreting it in relation to some social semiotic understandings, your histories, your background, your language, all of those things. You're using all of those things to engage with this current moment of what you're listening to me uh, and, and all, all whatever the other stimuli around you are. So, for example, there's a cat that you have or a little puppy or, for example, I, want, I feel like I, I need a, a drink, so I'm going to have a, a little sip of tea here. So all of these things you can see are happening in this material moment. So time then for the, for the human experience is only the present, right? Both the past and the future are essentially non-material. They inform us in terms of how we interpret the, the point that we are at now. So for example, our past will help us interpret what, what we will me meanings we will make out of my conversation or uh, your past interactions with your puppy will tell you what his behavior or her behavior is suggesting, right? So of course the past is an interpretive framework, but the past is not, it is not something that you can act on, right? You cannot act on the past. So I cannot go back and undrink or unsip that little cup of tea, right? I had a sip of tea, I cannot unsip it because even though it, it was a fact, that fact is now in the past, and therefore, all it is is an interpretive framework through which I can say that my tea is getting cold, right? So uh, we can sort of see these things of how we exist and how we are always meaning, making meanings. And notice, not just through language, which is a subset of sound, but through all this of sound, right? Remember, I gave you guys that little activity uh, on, on social media where I asked you to imagine that you're sitting in a room where you, you can hear the transport. Remember, we just talked about that. Remember those things. That's important because that is observation. That is experience. Experience is in the here and now. And the here and now are the three, these three senses are always here and now. Right? Whereas sight and sound may be here and now, but may not be here and now. And this is very important. So sight itself, for example, is huge. You're seeing a lot of things. If you just move around your, your neck right just now, like I'm doing, you will see so many things. I can see the tree out there. I can see my refrigerator. I can see some uh, paintings out on the wall. There's so many things that I'm seeing. I can see my, my cup of tea getting cold. Right, All of these things I can see in, in, in here and now. But at the same time, I'm looking at the screen and I'm reading this thing. Let me read this. The five material senses can be distinguished by considering two factors. Now, all of a sudden, by reading this, I am no longer in the here and now. I have moved away from the here and now. So that creates a juncture between and here and now. Right. So this is a juncture that we, we see that happens through reading and through sometimes listening to recordings, right? So things that are not here, when they become part of here, take us into another realm. And that is essentially what literacy does for us. It takes us away from the here and now and into another world, which is, the, which is a world of imagination. Now that world that we are reading through text can be about any form of knowledge or understanding. It can be about any category of things that we, we now understand. So once the category of language has been created, once the category of religion has been created, people can write anything about it and then we will read about it and it will be the reading and the references to the readings that will take our argumentation further. Now, let me rephrase it in terms of how academic knowledge is, is, is constant, currently being, uh, you know, essentially mass produced. It's, it's based on references, right? So for example, notice all research papers need to have references. As, you know, as editor of TESOL Quarterly, if somebody submitted a paper with absolutely no references, I wouldn't know how to handle it because uh, we are expected to have references. Now, why do we have references? Because we are building our knowledge on what other people have said. So what other people say becomes the foundation, whether, and then we 